A word about life. Uh, I'm borrowing from John O'Donohue a book called uh, Anakara, meaning soul friend. When love awakens in your life, in the night of your heart, it is like the dawn breaking within you. Where before there was anonymity, now there is intimacy. Where before there was fear, now there is courage. Where before in your life there was awkwardness, now there is a rhythm of grace and gracefulness. And where before you used to be jagged, now you are elegant and in rhythm with yourself. When love awakens in your life, it is like a rebirth, a new beginning. Please pray with me. Spirit of life and love. I am daring to do something this morning to walk on edges of awareness for myself, for each other. Do your work among us. For we are trusting that what you will do will bring us to a place where we will be better. We will be more whole. We would have more healing. We would have more peace. For it is true that the truth will set us free. But you forgot to say that it might really piss us off first. But that's the process. And so bless what is said and bless what is heard. Amen. Our discernment process begins with the assumption that God is moving all of creation from fragmentation to wholeness. Uh, another way to say this is the way I said it last week in a line from one of our founding theologians, Paul Tillich, and that is non-being is built into being itself. And love is the power, the power of being to unite that which is separated. Now please note a method to our ecclesial madness in the discernment process. Ministries acts of charity, love, reconciliation, healing, inclusion, justice, and spirituality. These are all concrete expressions of the power to overcome fragmentation, alienation, and brokenness. Voting to be an open and affirming congregation, offering a value-based, comprehensive human sexuality curriculum, offering sanctuary and hospitality to undocumented people. These are all cutting-edge, concrete expressions of so-called powerless love overcoming loveless power. These are indeed wedge blade ministries and have some important differences from traditional ministries. For a variety of reasons, we're in the middle of discerning what the spirit of life and love is doing in history, which is a big assumption, but that is our assumption. And what is the particular new wedge blade ministry we are called to do in partnership with God's work? Well, one of the characteristics of a wedge blade ministry, this how we will know that it is indeed a wedge blade ministry from all the other suggestions that have been made, is that we will feel called to do it, and we will know its rightness for us as we experience being stretched, and we experience 
an expansive beauty and joy while we do it. We will know it is a wedge blade ministry because, in other words, it will be messy, it will be beautiful, and it will be joyful all at the same time. Now with this said, it has been pointed out to me that our assumption about fragmentation and movement uh, uh, toward wholeness is mostly heard as an external work of the spirit out in the world. Uh, our thinking and our mad method is weak on an internal dimension. And I think this observation and critique is correct and I want to open us to more layers and uh, dimensions of discernment and this leads me to ask this question. What about the fragmentation within you? What about the fragmentation, the brokenness within me? When I look in the mirror, a man in the mirror, I see a middle-aged man with less hair on his head but more gray hair in his beard. I'm fairly youthful looking until you get up close. <laughs> up close there is evidence in my face that life has had its effect. Skin blotches, age spots, crow's feet, smile lines, wrinkles, more wrinkles, deeper wrinkles. My eyes look ageless, even though they don't always feel ageless. Behind my eyes is my brain. And in my brain is my mind. And in my mind are things that I share, things I do not share, things you see about me that I don't know, and things about me that no one knows, including myself. And this is true also of you. All of this combines into a greater, unique whole of my essence as a human being. Some could call this a soul. And it is in these layered depths that my greatest fragmentation has its potential. And also it is in these layered depths that it has potential for greatest wholeness. It is in this soul abyss that starts in the confines of our skulls but transcends our bodies and reaches out into the world that we have the greatest connection with God. This, I believe, is part of what theologians mean when they speak of the divine spark within us and the divine spark that all of us share. Now you see, sharing with each other the movements, the dance, the music, if you will, of our soul abyss is in itself a wedge blade ministry that deepens our connections to our true selves, to each other, our neighbor, and the world. And such sharing is the difference between biography and identity. Such sharing is the difference between acquaintance and intimacy. You see, biography is the story we tell others and the revealing of what we want to reveal. Biography is a kind of a social mask for personal protection. Identity, who we really are, is what lies behind the mask of biography. 
Now, I was put in Rock the Week. I just want to see if there is any kind of, uh, if we we're making a connection that way. And please be honest. Don't, don't worry. There's no judgment about it. We did put a link for today's message in there and had an animated uh, message about the difference between biography and identity. How many of you saw the link? How many clicked on it? How many of you did that? Just out of curious, obviously. Okay. There you go. You never know what you miss <laughs> if you don't open up Rock the Week and click on the links. I encourage you to do so. It's only about a 30 second, 45 second video. Allow me to speak of the identity and intimacy of these two things and the role of world religions. I first heard this from one of the original thinkers of the ecumenical order. His name is Gene Marshall. Western religions like Christianity, Judaism, and Islam focus on intimacy of the creature with the creator. We feel disconnected. We feel thrown out of the garden. And we are constantly, our lives are about trying to get back into the garden, trying to get back into intimacy and connection with the creator. And we do this, it does its best in its practices of prayer and meditation and service and communal worship to overcome the loneliness of being human and separated from God. Ultimately, these religions say that love is the way to intimacy with God. Eastern religions, like Buddhism, focus on identity. The practices of prayer and meditation, service and community are not for the purpose of connection, but are for the purpose of stripping away illusions and false attachments that cause suffering. False attachments to places, people and things that keep us from realizing our true place in creation. And our place in creation is very, very, very insignificant. And the more awareness we have of this truth, the more we can move through life with compassion, that is, with love, until finally there is no more identity, but only oneness with all being. Our souls are wonderfully and paradoxically move in both directions at the same time. We need connection and we need intimacy, but we also need autonomy and identity. Our quirkiness, uniqueness, neurosis and psychosis, individual and social pathologies, our individual stories and humankind's histories can be read through the lens of this paradox of being human. When we share these inner workings of fragmentation and wholeness, we are dropping our carefully constructed mask and we're moving from biography to identity. Now let me give you an example. Those who are participating in the discernment process in our after party time are experiencing an interplay of inner and external revelation. And I hope they are richer for it. For example, several individual external ministry suggestions were made and then they're clustered into a group and then the group of ministries were named. The name originally suggested for this group of ideas was reimagining power in the world. Because of all the stories of unjust use of power, to reimagine a just way seemed to be a ministry we may be called to do. However, while several people liked the naming of this group of suggestions, one person did not like it because the word reimagining kept the work, the work, the action, the concrete steps of transforming the use of power, it kept it in the head and they wanted to be sure that it did more than just stay in the head, that it was more than what we're just talking about it, that we actually did it out in the world. When that person said that they wanted this name of 
clustered groups of suggestions to be changed, they moved beyond biography and revealed something important about their identity. So let me offer a glimpse into the future. Shadow Rock will no longer thrive or survive as the Moon Valley quasi-religious social club. Fewer people attend and fewer people are looking to belong to a religious institution. However, I see this as good news. As Leonard Cohen said, cracks are where the light gets in. This is a definition of grace. We will survive and thrive as a cutting edge fellowship that will compel people to be a part of us because they will be amazed at how we love one another. Such intimate sharing will lead the way to going deeper. And its depth of being is what people are most hungry for. Easy to say, but difficult to do. You may be inclined to say, okay, Pastor Ken, you go first. That is fair. Earlier I mentioned that I see myself in a mirror. For the most part, I'm comfortable in my own skin and have clarity about who I am and where I'm going. However, like the random spasms in my back, I will sometimes be caught off guard by memories that cause spasms of shame. Out of the depths of my soul that no one knows fully, memories race up to the surface. Memories from all ages of my life, of deeds and words that were just plain stupid and unkind. And the spasm of shame will shake the core of who I am, sometimes for a moment and sometimes for a day. I can't remember a grocery list past three items, but there are some moments of shame from decades ago that I cannot forget. Then I remember cracks in my soul and sharing is where the light gets in. Just as all of us as individuals need each other as mirrors that reflect back love and an image of our better selves, so we as a community of faith, of people, of conscience, we are a mirror for the world out there. We act as a mirror when we speak the truth to power and when we love one another and we reflect back at society a better image of a human community. When we love one another, we are saying to the world, look at ourselves, we can be better. To discern what is going on in our inner world, to name it, and to share it demands even greater courage than discerning the work of God in the midst of history. But you cannot do one without the other. The processes of prayer and study and sharing knowledge and sharing ourselves strengthens both the inner and external wedge blade work that we are being called to do. One of the greatest strengths of these works together is the way that it strengthens our bonds with each other. And perhaps, perhaps this is why Jesus gave us only one commandment. Not because Jesus was a proponent of warm fuzzies and Hallmark cards, but because he was a champion for truth that would set us free. Perhaps this is why Jesus gave us only one commandment, love one another. And one of the ways we love one another is by being a mirror for each other. 
and for the world. Amen.